Zaveri. Is this how you know, pronounce it, Zaveri? Yes, correct. All right. Correct. Thank you very much. All right. Just a second, please. Bilal, başlıyor musunuz? Başladınız mı? Bak, bir dakika bekle. Ben şimdi şarjı koyayım. Şey, telefonu kursam. We're getting started. All right. Hello everyone watching and listening. My name is Tunjay Kardash. I am professor of international politics and director of Middle East Institute. Uh, I'm very happy to be able to chair this panel which is quite an important topic, actually, Iran and the international system. As you all know, the topic uh, revolving around Iran and its relationships with the region and with global politics and other global political actors uh, is a very important one, not least because of uh, security concerns and security implications of Iran's nuclear program, but also because of uh, the place that Iran occupies in the general framework of Middle Eastern politics. Uh, we are very happy to have three important papers in this afternoon. Uh, I want each uh, presenters to be uh, really finishing their presentations on time. We will be very it will be very helpful, we will be happy because we are running really short of time and there are plenty of uh, panels and presentations and each follows the other one, the previous one. So let's start uh, with Agnieszka Kuszewska. So the floor is yours. Go ahead, Thank please. You very much. Thank you very much. Uh, again, hello everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to participate in this uh, Middle East uh, Congress in Politics and Society. And I would like to discuss briefly the important issue of uh, the cooperation between China and Iran and its impact on, on regional security. I do think that it deserves a special attention, this Sino-Iranian axis, uh, in our analysis of, of shifting uh, security dynamics uh, in South Asia and Middle East, in the Middle East and, and beyond. Because if materialized, the proposed bilateral cooperation may have uh, far-reaching consequences, both uh, for bilateral uh, interactions, uh, for the uh, regional security, and uh, in, which includes the future development uh, of China's Belt and Road Initiative. So I will briefly uh, go to my presentation, which I will divide into four parts. The first, I will briefly introduce the cooperation and uh, present this theoretical framework, then I will address the issues which are very important in this complex uh, uh, Sino-Iranian relationship and uh, to show the complexity of the issue. So um, how the cooperation may influence China's relations with Pakistan, which is engaged in the CPEC project, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, what role uh, Iran may play in uh, the power rivalry uh, between China and India, and what are the prospects of developing bilateral relations. So my investigation is contextualized within Samuel Barkin's uh, realist constructivism, which I presume this combination of realism and constructivism uh, re uh, may be referred to, to, to discuss and to analyze this, these bilateral relations. So we have the principles which China emphasizes, so which, such as mutual benefits, common prosperity, community of shared destiny, and so on and so forth. And we also have uh, this kind of relationship between power politics by China and certain ideals China has tried to uh, introduce to the international relations on one hand, and on the other hand, the social construction of international politics, uh, which uh, somehow includes the alliances, mutual, bilaterally co coordinated social interactions, which can inspire certain political or ideological uh, shifts uh, in these relations. So um, by this rationale, I, I, I assume constructivism and realism 
are not counterposed against each other, but they could be rather synthet synthesized in order to extrapolate certain theoretical ramification and practical analysis. So, uh, Sino-Iranian relations may, may become an exemplification of China's ambition uh, to challenge American interests globally, and it can serve as a certain test or capacity, capacity, test of capacity to intervene in regional affairs. But what is important here that Iran is not a sort of a client state in these relations. Iran also has a regional and global ambitions, but obviously we have to emphasize the fact that its economy suffered during the uh, US, uh, the reimposed sanctions by Trump uh, administration, which China uh, condemned, and obviously the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so Ch uh, Iran has to do uh, whatever it can to strengthen its economy. So there are two things, motivation and ambitions, uh, which I would say that characterize the objectives of these two states. So what about this um, cooperation? Uh, the first proposal of enhanced uh, multidimensional cooperation, uh, a security-related uh, partnership was made by Xi Jinping during his visit into Iran in 2016, and then it was followed by this proposal of $400 billion uh, uh, economic military deal, or which uh, was negotiated between Tehran and Beijing, and it was this, as it was disclosed in July 2020. So this uh, includes, this is a, an idea of augmented cooperation, which includes both um, intelligence sharing, joint military exercises, which is not the first time because, for example, in 2019, and this is important here, this triangle, Iran, China, and Russia had joint naval exercise uh, in Indian Ocean and Gulf of Oman, which obviously terrified Washington. So this uh, cooperation, if materialized, it can significantly or substantially increase China's foothold in the Middle East. And it can provide China with something extremely important, which is the stable access to cheaper Iranian oil in exchange for China's contribution to Iranian sectors, different sectors like maritime, defense, infrastructure, telecommunication, energy, railway, sports, banking, and so on and so forth. So how this cooperation may influence uh, the general security uh, uh, scenario um, in the region, especially uh, the second point of my presentation, relations with Pakistan. Pakistan, as we all know, has long-term strategic cooperation with the United States, um, and it's directly engaged in China's Belt and Road Initiative. This grant project which will provide China the opportunity to uh, to challenge American assets to expand its foothold. But recently the cooperation between Pakistan and the United States has been weakened. And we can say that Pakistan is drifting more and more and more towards China. The CPEC uh, which will join Gwadar City, uh, Pakistan's um, port uh, built, constructed by China with Chinese support, to the western Chinese city of Kashgar via vast, via vast uh, network of highways, uh, railways, oil, gas pipelines. Once it's in implemented, it can provide uh, China with the sh shortest land route to Arabian Sea. So there is the idea that if China-Iran uh, cooperation or deal materializes, um, maybe Iran will uh, be part of this grand Belt and Road initiative. So, uh, in China, we'll have direct access to Iran's resources. So, um, there is a growing prospect that uh, Iran's close partnership with China may translate into Iran's formal inclusion in the Belt Road and Road Initiative, as the top leadership of Iran um, has uh, expressed the, the, the desire to, to join the entire CPEC project. So for Pakistan, it would be a chance for uh, enhanced cooperation also with Iran, even though these two countries have had uh, different uh, conflicts like sectarian violence, which escalated in the mid 70s, um, especially when Ziaul Haq came into power in, in Pakistan. So uh, therefore, uh, Pakistan is also interested in, in Chinese uh, cooperation with Iran may enhance Pakistan's cooperation with Iran, and Iran can contribute significantly to 
uh, to um, address uh, Pakistan's energy crisis uh, as it can increase its electricity export. So China appears, uh, as Ayesha Siddiqua, the uh, uh, renowned expert on Pakistan uh, relation, uh, international position, says that uh, China appears to be the important option and that this world dynamics will somehow uh, contribute to the enhanced alliance between United States, India, Saudi Arabia, and on the other hand, Pakistan will be a bit drifted towards, uh, towards potential enhanced alliance with Iran, China, and, and Russia. And the uh, role of Iran in power rivalry between China and India as uh, we know, India is also an important player here uh, in this regional power game with rising uh, uh, power ambitions and it remains in protracted conflict with Pakistan and China. Uh, Iran has developed cooperation with India, uh, which lost its boundary with Iran in the aftermath of the, in the aftermath of uh, inception of Pakistan in 1947 and the partition of this continent. So uh, since that time, we have the protracted conflict, the Kashmir conflict, which includes Kashmir and Pakistan became one of the crucial points of references in India's security dilemma, of course, apart from China as well. And New Delhi is interested in fostering relations with Iran. So we have this project, Chabahar, Zahedan, uh, which uh, is supposed to connect Iranian port to uh, Zeranj in Afghanistan. The aim, India's aim is to encircle Pakistan, which is considered an arch enemy of India. But uh, even uh, ever since the uh, reintroduction of US sanctions, India partly stopped cooperation with Iran on different infrastructure projects. Uh, for example, and in my last year, India stopped oil imports from Iran. Uh, but in December 2019, <clears throat> uh, Indian External Affairs Minister uh, visited uh, Iran and expressed uh, its, the country's intention to, uh, to expand the bilateral cooperation despite the US sanctions. So Pakistan and China have common goal in this game, which is aimed at containing India's regional influences. Uh, to pull Iran out of uh, its cooperation with India, for example, in, in this project, the Chabahar project. Um, so, uh, but on the other hand, uh, and uh, let me just uh, refer to the future, the prospects of bilateral relations between Tehran and Beijing and its, uh, and its possible uh, influence on, on the regional issues. So. India's deal, India's major interest is to push back China. So therefore, we have another important player here, the United States. As we know, the President Bush, uh, President Trump's uh, policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran was reckless and belligerent, and uh, it uh, escalated bilateral relations tremendously, especially when where the sanctions were introduced. So therefore, for India, the partnership, potential partnership with the United States or enhanced partnership with the United States will be important as China increases its foothold in the Middle East and seeks partnership with, with, uh, with different countries. So China wants to push back uh, India. In, in, this is like a, a rivalry between these two regional superpowers. So. Sino Iranian relations here may serve as, as an important uh, exemplification of China's ambitions and uh, to challenge these uh, American interests uh, globally. Uh, Iran um, has also regional ambitions. So uh, China may also be the important player which will influence relations between Iran and Pakistan. And I think that China will adopt two approaches. On one hand, uh, it will uh, strengthen or aim to strengthen, to enhance Iran-Pakistan cooperation within the Bree scope, but also it may contribute to the augmented rivalry uh, between these two countries uh, be, because uh, these two Muslim states will try to compete uh, to attract uh, China's attention more. So China may play its card by the so-called divide et impera uh, uh, policy by managing rivalry to achieve its strategic goals, but at the same time praising certain ideals uh, connected with enhanced 
cooperation within uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, two excuse, me to excuse me, no, no, Ex excuse me to interrupt you, but uh, I've been told that we will have time more than I thought actually. So please feel free to use up your time uh, and you can even extend it a little bit. So uh, let's say 25 minutes, all right? Okay, but I, I, I briefly, because I thought that I will have only 10 minutes. Yeah, uh, okay, I, I, I will also. Try. Sorry so about that. Slowly, uh, slowly go to uh, the conclusion. So this sort of divided imperas policy, China as powerful player in the region, uh, which wants to achieve a global superpower position in the world. And the major goal of China is obviously to contain the United States. But then we have two important issues which we should uh, address right now when we discuss the potential interactions uh, within the region, including uh, uh, the China-Iran relations. First issue is the fact that Joe Biden and Democrats won the elections in, Iria in the United States. And the second thing is uh, the potential results of coronavirus pandemic and its impact on the future uh, economy, uh, economic interactions and security related interactions in the region. So for Iran, um, cooperation with China is definitely an important element of its security policy uh, of uh, its economy, which is tremendously weakened by the sanction and especially right now uh, by the coronavirus, Iran had worse, some of the worst cases of COVID-19 in all of the Middle East. So uh, definitely Iran will play, will try to use uh, this, uh, this um, interaction or this rivalry between Washington and Beijing to achieve as much as it's possible. Uh, definitely Iran uh, with weak economy, with economic crisis will try to reach out also to the United States because we can assume that Joe Biden and Democrats will, will uh, perform a major shift uh, in their policy uh, towards middle, the Middle East, especially towards Iran. And they will be able and ready to renegotiate a nuclear deal and enter into some sort of economic cooperation with, uh, with Iran. So, but Iran obviously will not um, abandon the idea of uh, enhanced cooperation with China. Uh, there are a plethora of um, challenges Iran is facing right now, domestic and international. So we have tough sanctions right now. We have low oil prices due to the pandemic. We have uh, the threat uh, of international isolation. We also have countrywide protests. Iranian people bravely took to the streets, uh, try to uh, protest against uh, economic problems and, and even bravely against the Iranian regime. And obviously uh, the COVID pandemic uh, makes all things worse. So uh, there are many supporters uh, in Iran who uh, advocate China-Iran partnership um, because they want to use this opportunity to sell uh, oil to, and other resources to China uh, and engage in the Belt and Road and uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor project, which could also strengthen the border cooperation uh, in um, between uh, in Balochistan, Sistan, between China, between Pakistan and Iran if the project is materialized, but we have to, uh, you know, emphasize the fact that the CPET project goes through the very volatile regions in Balochistan and in Pashto areas. And there are many people in Pakistan, many representatives of, of local communities who violently uh, protest against uh, the CPET, uh, uh, emphasizing that it does not provide them with uh, any uh, benefits but only strengthens the power of the Pakistani army. So these are, there are a plethora of challenges, both, uh, both internal, both domestic and international, uh, which will um, accompany uh, China-Iran uh, future cooperation. Uh, but it may, uh, to some extent, uh, contribute to the newly shaped international uh, security related system in the region and strengthen 
the cooperation of United States and India. For India, I think this will be a very important element in, the, in its future security-related policy. And the United States and India, have both of them have one major goal, contain China. Moreover, Joe Biden is also expected to strengthen the cooperation, the very weakened cooperation with, uh, with, NATO, with NATO, the transatlantic cooperation against uh, growing uh, uh, influences of China. So this will be like, let's say, uh, the struggle between demo Western democracy and Chinese ambitions and assertiveness. Therefore, China will also try to uh, to strengthen its position and its foothold in the Middle East. Iran is obviously not the first country with which China is trying to cooperate or, or cooperate, but Iran, due to its resources and strategic location, can play a very significant uh, role in, in China's Belt and Road Initiative and in China's, in general, strengthening China's position. So I do think that the, the American authorities realize perfectly well, and they do understand much better than Republican administration, uh, all these uh, trajectories and all these uh, elements of, of uh, security related uh, uh, dynamics. So therefore, um, the United States will also try to engage more in Iran and to offer certain renegotiation of, of the nuclear deal and uh, which, which can uh, somehow um, weaken the hardliners in Iran who were extremely strengthened by Trump's uh, uh, um, belligerent policy. Uh, so uh, Iran will try, Iranian regime, Iranian government will uh, try to use the situation that it is like the major point of reference in the policies of two major superpowers both China and both the United States. So it will play this, uh, this game and try to achieve as much as it's possible. If we take into consideration Iran's strategic regional position, Tehran and its role, Tehran will be reluctant to achieve, to have this sort of patron-client sort of relations with Beijing, which uh, to a large extent characterize, for example, the relations of Pakistan and China and uh, will try to play a more important role in the Middle East. And uh, the U.S. role under Biden administration is, as I said, important to the future. China is a competitor, so this coordination of, uh, uh, of the policies aimed at containing China will be definitely strengthened. And I think that in, the, in these endeavors, uh, Iran will be one of the important points of, of, points of reference. Uh, so the smart policy maybe will be uh, to some extent introduced. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, that 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 would be it in my of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Agnieszka. I'm very happy that you have presented your very important topic. Uh, China is a global player, as we all know. Uh, but it is really little, there's little known uh, as a topic. Uh, I'm very happy that you have also suggested that it's a dynamic, ongoing mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. that, you know, that the kind of relationship that is unfolding, it's an ongoing dynamic relationship open to many factors. So I'm glad that you have pointed that out. Uh, uh, so I'd like to thank uh, Professor Agnieszka Kuszewska. Uh, thanks to her also for uh, finishing on time. By the way, I'm told that uh, there will be only three of us, sorry, three of presentations. So we are one uh, short of uh, four, which was originally planned. So we will have extra time for all of you. Uh, so I will say that our next uh, presenter, Aline Jat, the floor is yours. You have 25 minutes. Marhaba, um, good to be with you. Uh, good to see also Matub, although I don't see him uh, on video now. And uh, also good to be listening to Agnieszka. Um, what I'm going to do in the next few minutes, probably not 25, uh, so I'm going to keep it a bit shorter and then perhaps we can, I'm going to have more time for QA. Uh, I'm going to talk about a topic that I've addressed in my uh, SOAS PhD uh, dissertation. Um, many years ago, which is going to be published at 
at the end of this year, which is to look at Iran's international relations during the so-called nuclear crisis of the 2000s. And um, in this vein, uh, to have a look at uh, whether the so-called Eastern great powers, the non-Western ones, were able to uh, provide Iran with the benefits that uh, it has been desired. And uh, as you remember, uh, during uh, President Ahmadinejad, uh, Iran proclaimed the look to the East policy, which is uh, uh, a, a term for a geopolitical preference of the Islamic Republic of Iran vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Eastern great powers. And this look to the East was somehow revitalized uh, just a few years ago, um, out of the uh, 2015 U.S. Uh, unilateral withdrawal from the JCPOA. And if you look at those particular two junctions, you see uh, perfectly well that um, those proclamations, although they're uh, part of the Iranian foreign policy thinking, which I'm going to be talking about a bit uh, in, a, in a second, um, those uh, proclamations in favor of the look to the East policy uh, came from Tehran precisely at a time when there was great disappointment over the role of Europe uh, as a kind of balancing uh, power vis-a-vis -vis, uh, U.S. sanctions pressure. Um, but, um, you know, starting with uh, this look to the East uh, idea in Iranian foreign policy, this goes back, of course, uh, much more than a decade, uh, probably, I mean, at least uh, after the uh, collapse of bipolarity. Um, the idea is uh, quite simple. The idea is based uh, very much uh, on a material idea, that is the nexus between Western Asia and Eastern Asia, the former, uh, you know, uh, harboring the main hydrocarbon producers uh, in the world, and the latter East Asian economies being the, the most thirsty one when it comes to uh, energy supplies. So this is very much a material underpinning uh, of this idea of Iran uh, looking to the East or having a geopolitical preference for the East. And of course, there are ideational uh, elements to it as well. Uh, there is the idea that first, Iran is an Asian power, and as such, identity-wise, uh, it has to be part of Asia, and uh, uh, for that matter, not part of, uh, you know, uh, the Middle East itself uh, or uh, any other uh, geographical uh, security region. Um, another um, uh, underpinning uh, idea is that um, there are um, efforts towards establishing an anti-hegemonic front uh, against the United States. And for that purpose, Iran uh, should seek allies, powerful allies, uh, in the East, uh, in Asia to do that. So China or Russia or India are, uh, you know, contemplated about uh, as potential allies of an anti-hegemonic front uh, by Iran. Um, when it comes to Iranian foreign policy thinking, um, of course, there are diff different uh, foreign policy schools of thought, but uh, very, uh, you know, uh, briefly, one could argue that there is one school that has a geopolitical preference for the West, and there is another school that has a geopolitical preference for the East. The former school, uh, for, for instance, is very much represented uh, with the current Iranian government under President Rouhani, uh, that uh, was very much uh, a daemon uh, to forge a, uh, a deal with the West uh, in order to get sanctions uh, lifted and uh, so forth. Uh, but uh, the, the idea, uh, so, so this uh, Rouhani uh, school of uh, foreign policy, so to speak, has this geopolitical and for the West because it, regard, it has a different reading of international relations. Um, it has, uh, it agrees with those uh, from the hardline camp that the U.S. is in relative decline, but it doesn't see that the U.S. is an ultimate decline, uh, and it doesn't see the international system as a, as a fully multipolar order, but one that is increasingly multipolar. Uh, as a result, uh, although it sees that the U.S. is in relative decline, it uh, argues that the U.S. still has the power to um, to provide tremendous costs for Iran. Um, 
Whereas on the other hand, uh, the school of thought that is associated mostly with the hardliners, including the Supreme Leader and uh, large parts of the IRGC, are the ones who are uh, favoring a look to the East policy, uh, you know, closer relationships with China, but also Russia. Um, and because they, uh, as I said earlier, they have a different reading of international relations, international system and uh, the distribution of power within it. And they argue that uh, actually uh, they, they basically see China and uh, potentially other powers, including Russia, as a, a viable alternative uh, to uh, a US-led world order. Uh, and of course, there, is, uh, there are some ideological and political economic uh, considerations uh, in the various foreign policy schools of thought, geopolitical preferences as well, whereas the large Whereas the Rouhani camp, of course, is, uh, you know, is, um, try, is uh, arguing for an opening up for the economy. This can be seen as a threat to the uh, hardline camp uh, that uh, would see its monopolies questioned when uh, such, a, such an opening would happen. And therefore, the uh, hardline camp that is, uh, you know, very much uh, in favor of a, of a look to the East, um, is um, uh, seeking uh, is is uh, is understanding that a look to the East policy would not uh, potentially jeopardize their monopolies, so it's uh, less ri risky in political economic terms, and of course uh, ideologically uh, they're uh, closer to the East uh, because because of anti-Americanism, and last but not least uh, the hardline camp does not have to fear that uh, Eastern great powers would table issues such as human rights uh, and democracy uh, when uh, dealing with Iran. So uh, the kind of thing that, uh, for instance, Europe would occasionally do. So there is, um, <clears throat> there is a very clear uh, preference of the heartline camp in Iran for a look to the East. Um, yet uh, this look to the East uh, you know, idea has very much been also questioned uh, in Iran over the last few years because of the experiences in the past. As I, um, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, during uh, the nuclear crisis, Iran was, uh, uh, you know, for the first time, very strongly advocating for the look to the east, and yet the expectations associated with uh, what China, India, and Russia could bring to Iran were very much disappointed, and this uh, is not very difficult to understand um, because. Um, what is important to see is that the relationship uh, of those non-Western great powers, be it China, Russia, and India, their respective relationships with the United States is much, much more important than their respective relationships with Iran. Hence, those powers relationship with the United States, oh sorry, with Iran is only a function of their respective relationships with the superpower. In other words, none of these states, uh, neither back then, neither a decade ago, nor now, uh, now, as Agnieszka also uh, uh, mentioned in passing, um, has not been able to deliver uh, on, the, uh, on, 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 on the Iranian desire. So basically to provide for economic uh, benefits, especially at a time when, uh, you know, the US Mexican pressure strategy had uh, decimated the Iranian oil income. But uh, a decade ago, as well as now, uh, all of those powers plus other Asian powers have been extremely reluctant to engage in, uh, you know, meaningful trade with Iran, uh, to engage in, import, in, in importing uh, oil from Iran, uh, because they do not want to alienate uh, the United States and complicate their relationships with them. So in all cases. Um, um, plus the fact that when it comes to Iran and China, uh, there is what I call a cognitive dissonance, which is that for the Iranians, uh, China is basically uh, the, the biggest prize around um, uh, to engage with, uh, to potentially partner with, uh, to establish a post-US-led world order. Um, so, um, and this is, um, uh, so the cognitive dis dissonance is uh, based on the fact that for China, on the other hand, 
Iran isn't that important also in terms of uh, oil supplies. Uh, China has diversified its oil uh, supply supplies over the last years, over the last decade, uh, where the UAE, Saudi Arabia, but also non-Middle Eastern countries like Angola play a, a more important role. Um, so there is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, there is a lot of uh, speculation about the full, full potential of Iran-China relations, as we've seen over the summer, uh, and the various discussions about the 25-year strategic integration uh, agreement in the works. Uh, is that despite uh, undoubted tremendous potentials uh, in, in bilateral relations between Iran and China, in particular. Uh, there is no uh, enough appetite uh, from the Chinese side uh, to uh, to go uh, full scale in a direction that the Iranians might be satisfied with. So this is uh, something uh, important to understand because I mean uh, this will also not probably not dramatically uh, ch uh, change in the future, although uh, there are going to be of course modifications because of a uh, change policy of uh, the Biden president. Uh, but China will be uh, very much uh, is not interested to alienate the United States and the Middle East, and Iran therefore is a minefield uh, for China. Uh, it doesn't mean that the Chinese and Iranians are not going to try to deepen their relationship and cooperation. Uh, they're going to do that, but not to the extent of which the Iranian side would uh, would desire. So I think, uh, I'm going to stop here. And, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. I'm really happy that you also are uh, finishing your presentation just uh, on time. Um, again, Dr. Najat's uh, presentation pointed to really important question of how Iran juggles between great powers, which is increasingly the case and which will be increasingly the case after Joe Biden uh, becomes the president. Uh, in January. So I'm thinking like this topic will not go away anytime soon. And we're happy that we have heard from uh, Dr. Nejad uh, about the details of this very important topic. I'm sure that there are some questions coming up already for this presentation. Um, now again, we are moving to our next uh, presentation uh, from uh, Mahjoub Zaveri. Uh, and the topic of his presentation is Gulf States and the Arab world, which is also important in terms of its uh, place in the regional dynamics uh, of which Iran is part. So uh, it will be very helpful if uh, you start your presentation, uh, please. You also Thank you so much. 25 minutes. No. Thank you so much. Um, uh, let me first thank you all um, for the invitation. Thank the organizer for this invitation. It gives me great pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Because uh, I'm very pleased to see my uh, friend uh, Ali as well here. Uh, good to see you, my friend. Um, well, uh, my presentation basically will focus on two, um, uh, I would say, I would, I'm dividing it in two sections. The first section, so we'll be looking at the Arab Gulf states and the Arab world. And the second section will be looking at um, Iran. Where is Iran from all of those dynamics? Looking at the, um, uh, the relations between Arab Gulf states and the, Arab, and the other Arab world, the other, part, the other Arab world, there was uh, in the late, in the, I would say since 2010, there was a big question mark. I mean, what happened? Why Gulf state is becoming involved in Arab politics? These kind of questions came as they are for the first time are involved in, in, in Arab world politics. Actually, uh, Arab Gulf states and on the top of them, Saudi Arabia, were involved in the Arab politics since the, the Second World War. Uh, we remember the uh, Palestinian question and uh, the involvement of Saudi Arabia uh, at that time. Um, and also we remember the involvement on Saudi Arabia on the oil embargo in 1973. Um, and we also remember that, uh, uh, you know, the opportunities opened by Arab Gulf states to a lot of Arabs to work in the Gulf uh, here and then 
basically they send their own uh, uh, money to the other Arab countries where they were able to contribute to the development on other Arab countries. So the involvement uh, did exist um, and it was also significant um, and on political, socioeconomic levels. What, is, what was interesting in the recent years is the actually is the proactive role of the Arab uh, Gulf states. That is actually, I would say, call it the new stage, the proactivism that Arab Gulf states, uh, or some of them, they become a proactive on regional politics and international politics as well. And, and um, I think all of this happened, actually, I would say, after the invasion of Kuwait 1990. Um, I think the reliance, the, the understanding that, you know, we are, for example, you know, an oil, oil small countries, you know, uh, we have a good alliances, so it's enough to rely on them. I think this has, has been changed because of what happened in Kuwait. Uh, Kuwait, a country overnight, has been invaded by a neighboring, uh, you know, brother uh, Arab country, and uh, the world, uh, you know, knew what happened. So I, I think uh, since 1990, there was uh, the seed, the seed for proactivism and in politics when it comes to the Arab Gulf states. The real dynamics, uh, we witnessed that basically late, simply because uh, the consequence of the, um, uh, the invasion of Kuwait was absolutely uh, strong on Arab politics because it started the, what's so-called the Arab peace process with Israel. And here, another chapter of involvement of Arab Gulf states in Arab politics, because Madrid conference in 1991 we never succeed without the contribution of Arab Gulf state financially and politically. And we know that the Palestinian Authority in 1990, after the Oslo Agreement and then Wadi Arab Agreement, and then all of those, in a way or other, they were had the blessing from our Arab Gulf states because of the alliance with the United States as well. So things are very interlinked, and it's hard to see that Arab Gulf states were not involved in any level in Arab politics. Uh, 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 pre, I would say, uh, 2000. Now, the second chapter, which is very significant, is the proactivism, is being involved more and initiate. I think it was obvious that um, uh, if one can say uh, the uh, Al Jazeera channel uh, in, in Qatar was, was one of the evidence of this kind of proactivism, is actually uh, guiding the discourse, reshaping the narrative of Arab politics. And that was a very interesting move because this network is not about only just a network broadcasting the news. It's actually reshaping the narrative, reshaping the discourse on the Arab world when it comes to the authoritarianism, to the freedom of speech and other, etc., etc. So that was also a very interesting chapter of this proactivism. Now, the reaction even from within the Arab Gulf state, to that was weak, and this can be seen in Arabia and then Sky News and other uh, outlets, which did not approve to be actually succeed in, in any level. The the second level of proactivism, I would say, in, in regional politics, basically we we start witnessing that um, in the um, after the invasion of Iraq 2003, where more, you know, uh, more, 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 uh, 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 I would say, role is being played in, in uh, international politics. The United States will not be able to do whatever uh, it did in Iraq without sort of support from regional players, including Arab Gulf states and Turkey and others. So this is also an important chapter. So it's being engaged, engaged on international politics. The serious event, uh, the serious uh, milestone, I think, it was the Arab Spring. Arab Spring basically was a, a very interesting, important milestone where you see a real proactivism from Arab Gulf states. Basically, Arab Spring has divided Arab Gulf states into two fronts. One uh, front which basically says what's happening is, is, is good as long as Arab people want that. The other front says, no, the status quo is good, we don't want to change, and it's obvious, I don't need to remind uh, 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 you that, you know, it, it's obvious that um, uh, Qatar, for example, was, uh, you know, um, uh, in favor of what's happening uh, as long as it's happening because of what Arab uh, people want. So the Arab Emirates were in, in, you know, I would say, uh, maintaining the status quo uh, uh, pre-2010. Uh, so that division uh, basically reflected on Gulf-Gulf relations 
and on Gulf Arab relations, because basically we started to see alliances. Now this alliance and this kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, access as they call them, um, uh, we, we, we witness see Saudi Arabia, Egypt, for example, Emirates, um, uh, uh, Qatar on the other side, so it was Turkey and, but let's go back to 2000, for example, six and eight, and we see that, for example, there was, a, there was the same, I would say, the, the, the source, sort of fronts were shaped at that time, where, for example, uh, uh, Syria, Iran, uh, Qatar, Hezbollah, Hezbollah, and Hamas were in, in one front, according to the other, and those are the American front, who, who are basically pro-American. So this kind of coalitions, or alliances, were, were, were there, but what's interesting about what happened at 2010, they become clear within the Gulf politics. So we witness that, you know, there is a serious role played by each front. What's also interesting to see, there is a proactivism in the level of international politics, where you see Oman is coming and say to the Americans, to the Iranian guys, I'm ready to facilitate uh, 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 any kind of discussion between both, both of you. Please come. And 2008 and nine, we remember what happened in, in, in uh, 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 in Oman. So these kinds of level of proactivism were very clear, were, were become, increased actually rapidly uh, from the uh, 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 Gulf, uh, Gulf states. Now, of course, those created more division within, within uh, 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 Arab Gulf states. For so example, Saudi Arabia was not happy of Omani role of facilitating discussion between Tehran and Washington. Um, Qatar was, maybe was in favor of that, was not seeing this, uh, you know, a big deal. You know, every, every country has the role to play a role uh, as long as it, you know, it can, it can maintain it. Um, uh, so there was a disagreement and those level of agreement were in, actually uh, uh, had increased rapidly between uh, uh, the, uh, uh, within uh, Gulf states uh, uh, as a whole. The, f the first reaction we see to the, of, or, or reflection of these differences or, or, uh, was 2014, when you see Saudi Arabia, Emirates, and Bahrain, basically they would draw their um, ambassadors from uh, Qatar. That was a reflection of that regional role that each country was playing. So the reflection was, I'm not happy of that role. I cannot, I'm no longer can cope with this. That is the message Saudi Arabia was trying to send Bahrain and Emirates, that they no longer can cope with this. And eight months, nine months, the, the problem solved and the ambassador were sent back to Doha. But the issue did not disappear because there, you know, both, you know, every country continued its policy, regional policy. Qatar continues its mediation. Saudi Arabia con con continued relation with Egypt, bringing, uh, you know, uh, get rid of Mohammed Morsi, uh, elected president, uh, bringing, um, you know, an army back to politics in Egypt. Uh, and supporting all counter-revolution in the Arab world, in Libya, in, in, in uh, you know, the, 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 decisive, the, the, the decisive storm in Yemen and the ramification of that. So they, they went uh, at the end, um, you know, to, in, their, in their way to uh, fight any possibility of change in the Arab world, while the other side, you see, for example, uh, Qatar, uh, maybe Kuwait a little bit, uh, they have, uh, I would say, a positive position to what's happening in the Arab world and trying to mediate to uh, calm down the uh, situation. Of course, just three years later on, 2017, we witnessed that Egypt actually is paying back to Emirates, Bahrain, and Saudi and saying, look, I'm joining you on boycott in Qatar, which is the blockade in Qatar in 5th of June, 2017. That is an important milestone in this kind of change of politics and the relation between Arab world um, and, and the Gulf. Egypt, that country, in, in, you know, uh, close to the Mediterranean, joined three GCC countries on imposing a blockade on a neighboring country. That was a very interesting move because this shows that, you know, uh, you know the, 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 uh, the reflections and the reactions to what Qatar is doing get to the end from those uh, uh, countries. And now, still, this, this kind of blockade is, is, is continuing. So these kind of just uh, important milestones show us how much there was in a dynamics when it comes to Arab Gulf state and how much they become active and what was the ramification when it comes to 
bilateral relation, even from with GCC as a regional uh, uh, organization. And these kind of differences uh, uh, is likely to continue as long as these kind of differences. We are living in a, in a, in a, in a time where politics in the Arab world, uh, there was a lot of vacuums, uh, and those vacuums need to be filled. And the, any player now, including Gulf states, if they can fill the vacuum, they will fill it using uh, alliances, using uh, 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 your economic uh, uh, um, uh, and, uh, um, power uh, and, and network, they will, be, they, they will uh, basically maintain this. So as long as those vacuum exists, it's likely to see such, uh, 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 I would say, differences uh, continue. Now this is, this, is, this is a part. Now where Iran from all of this? And the time where Saudi Arabia and Emirates, for example, they disagree with Iran, and they basically, uh, they said in 2017 in, on what they call the condition against Qatar, they said one of the condition is to cut the relation with Iran. They, Emirates, they opened the, their relations with Iran and strengthened their relations with Iran, and uh, um, you know, say that there is no crisis on the relation between Abu Dhabi and, and uh, Iran. Uh, but they wanted Qatar to cut the relations with Iran. So Iran actually is in the center of this dynamic of the relation between Arab Gulf state and Iran. And let me remind you, this was the case even before. And the relation between the Arab Gulf state and Mohammed Hosni Mubarak, Iran was always on the, on, on, on the scene. Iran was always discussed. And all, Iran was always used as a political card. Mohammed Hosni Mubarak, when he wanted to get a, uh, an aid from Gulf state, he will bring Iran and said, you know, we, we may normalize relation with Iran, and then he finds a phone call that, no, 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 we will support you. And then, you know, if, if, if there is an issue, he will, of course, make statements. And then that, you know, uh, the security of Gulf state is, is, you know, well related to the national security of Egypt. And, you know, such, such statements will be enough uh, at that time. So uh, Iran was there. Iran actually uh, have impact and shadow the relations between even you know, uh, um, after the Arab Spring, it was obvious that, you know, uh, it's very interesting to see Saudi Arabia and Iran and Emirates in one line on the counter-revolution in the Arab world. Because so Iran was against Arab Spring when it comes to Syria, was against Arab Spring when it comes to Yemen. And obviously, that brought them together. And that's very interesting because despite the fact that they are not a good, guy, a good friend, but in this issue, they actually, they meet and they agree on the fact that Arab Spring should not succeed. So that's an important, actually, uh, point to be uh, raised. Uh, even, even in the last 10 years, uh, uh, Iran was, was, was engaged in all of this. Iran basically, uh, uh, when, when the blockade imposed in Iran on, on Qatar, said, no, 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 this is not acceptable. Uh, you know, no one, when, when there was a debate about invasion, they, dis they, di they discussed this with Turkey and said, no one can change the geopolitics of the region. Uh, so they worked with Turkey and tried to, you know, to, to, to send a, a strong message to the Saudi Arabia and Emirates. So Iran has interest to see the Gulf divided, but not necessarily fighting each other. Uh, at the same time, they want to see, they don't want to see that Gulf has one word, one position when it comes uh, to Iran, they are interesting. They are they are they are uh, enjoying that moment to see uh, Gulf states divided. But again, they are not happy if they see a serious collapse to the region to the Gulf region in terms of security and stability. And that was an important issue uh, to be also uh, noted. Um, even in, in in recent years, with the relations developed uh, uh, between, for example, Qatar and and, and Iran, um, uh, it. For example, United Arab Emirates remain the best uh, trade partner to the uh, 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 Iranians uh, until uh, now. Um, I, would, I would conclude with, with this. Uh, there is no doubt that all of those dynamics uh, influenced by the external players, actor, which is the United States. You know, how, where the United States from all of this? Um, the United States always uh, also play a role in this. Uh, the United, for example, United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia in 2016, they supported Trump based on the fact that he will be weak in Iran. And based on that, they were supporting him financially, and they hoping that 
he will be able to weaken the regime as much as he can. The only thing he did is maximum pressure, more sanctions, and that's it. So now I think they are facing the, 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 the reality that this president may, will be, may be different. And basically, all of what they uh, uh, paid to uh, 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 Trump is actually is gone to the hell. Uh, I think that is something to be also uh, noted. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, uh, all right, so we have plenty of time, uh, but let me first uh, briefly uh, mention what uh, Mr. Zaveri uh, so far told us. Uh, there are a lot of things going on now in the Arab world, a um, lot of divisions in the Gulf, and they are really, really trying to figure out how they can make most of it. And they also would like to see how uh, they can play uh, the great power card against each other, including Iran. Iran is also happy to see a divided Gulf, but not uh, having a single position against itself. So we're, we're, we're uh, having a very interesting picture emerging out of uh, the role of Iran and how it is uh, actually uh, playing the regional power position in the region. So, as I said, we have plenty of time, but we will try to uh, have certain questions. Uh, let me ask in the order that I have received them. The first one is to uh, Professor Agnieszka Kuszewska from Furkan Yolju, and it goes something like this. Uh, which is rational for Iran to do when both the US and China want to engage in constructive affairs from a realist perspective? Let me... I answer? From realist, but uh, uh, Iran's realist perspective. Yes, I mean, from a realist perspective. Sure, what is sure. best for Iran to do? As I, as I mentioned, that uh, this uh, realist perspective will be extremely important here in, uh, in Iran's uh, foreign policy with regard to China and the United States. Uh, this sort of neo-realist approach, uh, which uh, engages Iran directly in the local and regional and global power game. Uh, so, therefore, Iran will try to, uh, what I assume, uh, try to gain as much as, as it's possible and to strengthen its, uh, its geopolitical, security-related and economic position. Uh, because Iran currently faces, as I mentioned, uh, a plethora of challenges. So, therefore, I would say that this neorealist approach uh, if we uh, refer to theoretical analysis of international relations, will be one of the most important elements uh, for the theoretical framework uh, when we discuss Iran's, Iran's foreign policy. Um, and I would also say that the, the, the fortunate change of power in the United States and the ultimate failure of, of, of Trump also provides Iran with some additional uh, possibilities uh, because previously the interaction with the United States was entirely hostile during the Trump administration. But now we all hope, and also in Europe, we do hope that it will change as many European companies and United and American companies lost a lot when uh, the sanctions were introduced and the majority of European Union countries were absolutely against. Uh, re the reimposition of, of sanctions on, on Iran. So I would say that this uh, change and this uh, cooperation between the EU and the United States it gives Iran as well certain additional uh, uh, chances, possibilities in its uh, foreign strategic, uh, strategic policy. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, let me also ask I mean, uh, convey another question from uh, Mehmet Rakipolo to uh, Zveri. Uh, and the question goes something like this. How do you see the Biden administration's impact 
uh, on the Gulf relations, on the Iranian-Saudi competition, particularly? Professor. Okay. Uh, sorry. Well, um, I think um, there, are two, there are two levels to, to answer this question. The first level, w there, historically, um, there isn't always a, a crisis, not a crisis, I would say, I would, uh, I would say there isn't a, a serious matter when it comes to Democrats and the Gulf. Um, Saudi Arabia, in particular, always was worried of Democrats. Democrats, they, have the, they talk about the human rights, they talk about you know, freedom of speech, they talk about all of these things. And Biden did mention all of this in his campaign and they criticized um, Mohammed bin Salman uh, directly. So these are a serious matter. Uh, and actually, I'm, I'm just, um, I'm, I'll be talking in, in tomorrow morning about this issue. So there is, uh, there is a serious concern from specific countries in, in, in the Gulf. It's not necessarily all of the Gulf states are worried uh, on the same level. I don't think so Oman is worried. I don't think so Kuwait is worried. I don't think so Qatar is worried. I think Qatar in particular, Qatar relies on the fact that they deal with the, with the institutions. Even when Trump was in power, they were dealing with Pentagon, with the Department of State, with other institutions. And now what's interesting and what's really interesting in the Doha position is that Democrats relying on institutions. Democrat Biden will not avoid, will not over, uh, over, uh, over, uh, you know, uh, or disrespect the decision of the Pentagon. He will take into consideration the decision or the, the recommendation of Pentagon or Department of State or other institution. So that itself is serving the interest of, uh, for example, Doha. Uh, but again, uh, when it comes to to uh, uh, to Iran, uh, I think uh, Biden and Democrats they signed the deal 2015 without any kind of consultation with Arab Gulf states. That's obvious that, that is, that's happening, that's happened. Uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia was very upset of that. Um, and it has been said that the green light was given to uh, Saudi Arabia to start the decisive storm in 2015 was just to call it down and say, look, you can do something, go and uh, uh, weaken uh, uh, Houthis in Yemen which was unfortunately until now did not finish and war in Yemen is actually the a big mistake now. B Biden himself is actually saying this war should be ended yesterday, not tomorrow. Uh, so there, there, we, should, we should expect more, uh, uh, um, I would say, change comparing uh, with, with, with Trump. But also we have to remember, this president did not came to the White House, or he will not be in the White House in 20th of January 2021 based on foreign policy agenda. This president came on a domestic politics agenda, COVID-19 agenda, build, rebuilding the economy agenda, re-ending uh, the isolation of the United States uh, when it comes to the organization. So even foreign policy, it seems number three, number four, it's not number one. So we, I personally, I do not expect that Biden will have serious actions when it comes to foreign policy, whether concerning the Gulf or Iran, before, spring, before September 2021, simply because there is another election in Iran in 18th of June 2021, which is the presidential election of Iran. And I think those six, seven months will be sort of on waiting mood, mood rather than anything uh, else. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much. Uh, another question for Dr. Najat from uh, Mustafa Kupeli, and I'm, I will rephrase it a bit uh, to make it more understandable. Uh, do you think that Iranian nuclear issues, which isolated Western countries, can actually play into the hands of China? And second part of the question, how, I mean, what would the Iranian political class uh, expect from China in terms of this problem? Well, thank you. I mean, um, I mean, the nuclear issue uh, for sure has been um, an advantage uh, for many uh, powers that stand between Iran and the United States. So there have been a lot of actors that have been op uh, acting opportunistically uh, Russia, for instance, um, because uh, uh, 
I mean, imagine if U.S. energy sanctions on Iran would be lifted. Uh, Iran could potentially be a veritable competitor for European energy supplies for Russia. So Russia is basically interested in the maintenance of the conflict. And uh, so probably something similar is true with, um, with China and uh, other countries uh, that can uh, benefit from the enmity between Iran and the United States. China has obviously benefited from it because it has entered the market in uh, the wake of the U.S. Um, uh, pressure to all of the European countries, uh, so to speak, a ago. Uh, you know, something similar has happened a few years ago again. So... Uh, um, there are uh, definitely uh, countries and great powers that do benefit from this kind of, you know, enmity in the nuclear conflict. And uh, whereas they do not want to see, uh, and this is true for Russia, for China, a uh, nuclear armed Iran, uh, for obvious reasons. So they are interested in preventing and, 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 and you know, and supporting also Western measures that could curb the Iranian nuclear um, and on the other hand, they act quite uh, opportunistically, of course, uh, and looking at their own interests uh, dealing with Iran when it comes to, to the question of repatriating uh, funds uh, to Iran or to the country or not, or in engaging in some kind of barter deals, uh, uh, you know, uh, countries like China could send their goods to Iran. Uh, I mean, India did that. As well, maybe. Uh, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this. Uh, I mean, this brings us to an end. Uh, but before we finish, let me uh, also say that there are indeed lots. We, we have learned a lot from this panel. Thank you very much for all the uh, insightful comments from the panelists. Uh, there are still lots of unknown parts in the context of Iranian and Gulf uh, politics and their relationship vis-a-vis -vis each other and with the great powers. Uh, so thanks a lot to Professor Agnieszka Kuszewska, thanks to uh, Dr. Ali Nejat, and thanks to Mah Mr. Mahjub Zaveri. Uh, very uh, nice to have you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank thank you. Hopefully thank next you. time we will meet in Turkey. Well, thank that's you for that. Thank hopefully. You. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, um, thank you for the viewers, listeners, and watchers. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you all on board. Uh, so this brings us uh, to the end of our panel. Thank you again. Thank, thank you. Bye bye. Bye.